how do we detect DNA in isolation? Uh, there are earlier approaches. Uh, these are pretty expensive. Well, so it's no, it's not necessarily expensive. It's it's a experimentally, it's a pretty tricky experiment to do. Um, the really high accuracy DNA methylation approach now is called bisulfide sequencing. Basically, you get the DNA from the cell, you, you isolate the DNA, you treat the DNA with a, a reagent of bisulfide, and during this treatment, all the unmethylated C will be converted to a T. Sorry, I need to somehow change, change the annotation. So all the unmethylated C will be converted to a T, then you sequence the DNA with and without the uh, bisulfide sequencing. You, you, or you can just sequence the, the bisulfide treated uh, DNA. But basically, it's like a sequence, you have to um, sequence the genome by a significant coverage, potentially over 30% coverage. This way, it will help you generate high-resolution DNA methylation maps that are very quantitative but expensive. So I will show you how this is done. So supposedly, this is the original geno genetic or the, the DNA sequence, okay? And um, if we sequence the DNA in this space, you can see here, it's um, like if you, in this space, you see two T's, but, uh, yeah, so sorry, the top is the actual original reference DNA, but uh, you sequenced uh, some reads in here, and this read has a C, next read has a T and T and CC. It would mean that in the original DNA, if it's already, it, if it's methylated, then it will not be converted to a T, but if it's not methylated, it will be converted to a T. And since the T is, uh, or, yeah, so the T is 40% uh, of the total, it would mean that originally 40% of this T in this location are unmethylated, but 60% of the, the Cs in this base are methylated. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you, you look at this, uh, in this case, this region is 100% unmethylated. Right? That's why it's converted to a T. Maybe this region is, in this case, is 40% unmethylated, but 60% methylated. And this region is, um, yeah, 100% unmethylated. Okay? So in order to really get a good readout, you can imagine at every nucleotide base where you have a C followed by a T, or this is just a scenario. Uh, example, most of the time, CPG happens, uh, sorry, a DNA methylation happens on the C followed by the G. So this type of CC convert to a T is not very often. I, I just want to show an example in this case, okay? But you can imagine, in order to have a good readout, you need to, in each region, you need to have enough reads covering this region in order to know whether it's 10% or 50% or 60% or methylation, okay? So this creates some computational challenges in here. Uh, so this is the original read. You, you, the, sorry, the, uh, this is the orig original DNA. It, once it's converted into a C or a T, remember, suppose that you are the computational biologist and it's the first time somebody did a bisulfide sequencing and they give you the DNA. When you try to map that read, back to the genome. Assuming that you can do fast QC and the data quality is good, you map them to the human genome. What you will find is that a lot of reads do not map to the genome very well because, because the Cs have been converted to a, G, to a T and there are a lot of bases that are changed and then it doesn't find a location in the human genome. And so mapping is a major quantitative issue in this. Uh, so remember, this is uh, supposedly the, yeah, so the reference genome, if it's C, in the bisulfide sequence read, it can be either a C or a T if this C is not methylated. But if the reference genome is a T, it will only go to a T, right? And so you can imagine every time, so 
if, if in the original, if you use BWA to do the read mapping, you need to have an index to see where the, the, that particular sequence come from in the human genome, right? And so in some sense, we have to create a new reference. For example, um, if this is the original genome, if this is the original genome, every time you see a C, you have to create an addition. Uh, besides the original C, you have to create an additional uh, index for this space being converted to a T, for the next space to be converted to a T, the next C to be converted. Every time you see a C, you have to create an additional index for that base to be converted to a T. So it hugely increased your mapping uh, space. Okay, so the, the, the read mapping algorithm for bisulfide sequencing is pretty expensive. Oh, by the way, I want to mention that um, because bisulfide sequencing is pretty expensive, later on, there are also techno techniques developed uh, called RRBS, which mostly enrich for the CPG reach, like the CPG island sequence in the genome. This way, you only sequence, you know, put your money in where it, it counts. So on the CPG reach regions for sequencing, you can save some cost. Although some people might want to know what's the DNA methylation status on the non-CG reach regions as well. Anyway, so for the read mapping, there are algorithms. Uh, there's like Bismarck or BS map, these kind of uh, algorithms that are available. Yeah, you, you created the additional sequence in the BWA index in order to really account for the C to T conversion during bisulfide treatment. Okay, so in the mapping, it's kind of much more complicated. Another uh, potential complication is supposedly the reference genome is like this. If you read, if you get the sequence read like this, uh, versus supposedly if the reference genome is like this, you both get like a sequencing read. So that's in the top, this is two different regions of the genome. One has CG, CG here, the other has TG, TG here. But when you see the sequencing reads, how do you know this T is, so supposedly there are also kind of single nucleotide changes in the human genome, right? So you and, and I, we might differ by one base. Maybe that base happened to be on the C base. So when I see a sequencing read that has a TG, how do I know whether this T is coming from a bisulfide conversion from a C to a T, or that guy's original reference genome is, the, is, is C or T? I guess one way is if you don't do bisulfide sequencing, right? You just do the original genome sequencing, you read out the DNA, then you ask, okay, is this, is this space a conversion or is it just a nucleotide difference between individuals? But that's twice the cost. It will be twice as expensive because you have to sequence the bisulfide treated DNA for 30X, you have to do the un untreated DNA for, for 30X. But are there other reasons, other things you can do just using your limited data to get the DNA methylation. So to figure out whether this space is a methylated C, or sorry, unmethylated C converted to a T, or whether the reference genome itself is a T. The, not reference, but like this guy's real genome is a T. You know how you can do that? So let's imagine what happens on the other strand on the DNA. So DNA is double-stranded. And if there is methylation, this methylation happens symmetrically on the CG, right? It happens on the C in the first strand. It happens on the, the C on the reverse strand. Let's think about what happens on the reverse strand. If this region originally was a C and being converted to a T, it would mean that the reverse complement in this location will also be a C in here and a G in here. And a C in here and a G in here. And if the one strand is not methylated in on this C location, then the other strand on that C, it will also not be methylated. And if it's not methylated, when you use bisulfide treatment, 
it's gonna convert that C into a T as well. So if you have reads that are mapped to the reverse strand, you should see also this base. Sorry, I, this, it's a little bit misaligned, but I hope you can see. If you see GT and, sorry, TG and the GT in, this, in the two strands, that means the original DNA is a CG and it's only being converted to a, a TG because of uh, no methylation. However, you can imagine if the original DNA without methylation, it's like not conversion, the original DNA was a TG, then the reverse complement would be a CA, right? And most likely this C will not be methylated. And then during the conversion, it will be converted to a T. It will be, in this case, oh, sorry, it will be converted to a T. Yeah. So this will be a T and this will be a T. And then when you read it out, you will see, yeah, whenever you see that, that's an unmesylated. Okay, so in order to see whether something is mesylated or whether the original DNA had that base being different, you have to look at reads from both ends, then you can tell whether that base is, is mesylated or not. This way you don't have to sequence the original unmesylated, sorry, the, the original genome with regular sequencing. Uh, sorry, Sam? Daniel, sorry, sorry. Um, so I guess you would do isolate treatment before you do a kind of amplification, right? So, you would, so do you do the amplify after the bias? Yeah, so the question is whether you have to amplify the DNA before uh, or after bisulfide treatment? Uh, the answer is you do the bisulfide treatment first, then you amplify. And so when it's converted, the amplified DNA will also be converted. Because once it's converted, it will just look like a T. Then in the DNA, when you do PCR to amplify that region, that all the Ts will be amplified as T. But when you get the read from both ends, you will have a fairly even coverage on both ends. So plus strand reads and minus strand read. And based on what you see on top strand and bottom strand, you will know whether this T is because of a base conversion from bisulfide or, based, or because of the original DNA being different. Uh, Jet. When you do the bisulfide treatment, does it actually replace the methylated C with the T or does it just like chemically make it? Uh, yeah, so what, yeah, the question is what really happens when you do bisulfide sequencing? It does not do the cut and replacement. It just chemically converts. If you look at the methyl C and the T nucleotide on the chemical whatever equation, you will see that they look very, very similar. And so after the conversion, it's, yeah, chemical reaction. Okay. All right. So there are a number of very interesting uh, computational analysis on DNA methylation. Uh, so after we can map it, then people started looking at what does DNA methylation really do, right? Um, can you use it for something? The, uh, the first thing is what people found is that DNA methylation usually are quite consistent within a short distance of a few hundred or maybe uh, potentially a K or a couple KB long. Oh, so because, so for example, in this case, if I have a CG here and a CG here and a CG there, because they are so close, very often if this is methylated, next is methylated, and third is methylated. Um, usually because of this DNMT1 or so DNMT3 enzyme, basically once it goes there to methylate, it will just try, like slide back and forth and methylate the nearby uh, CG as well. And so if your readout is not as accurate, Say, in your sequencing, you don't have good enough coverage to estimate a good methylation level. You can look at the nearby CG regions to smooth the signal to give you a more robust DNA methylation um, percentage estimate. Okay, so the nearby ones are quite similar. And, and also, because of this, you know, nearby regions are, are, are similar, uh, the reality is if you see as few CGs in here, in this case, few CGs close by, they are either all methylated or they are all unmethylated. It's hard to see situations when one is methylated, the other is unmethylated. And so as a result, if you look at the region in the genome, 
they are e so in this region, say uh, ten k or not ten k is too long. Maybe a uh, one to two kb region. Within here, most of the regions are either the C CGs are either all methylated or all unmethylated. So you see, when you estimate DNA methylation in say a pure cell, like a cell line growing in the deep petri dish, you map the DNA methylation, you will see that um, most of the DNA methylation happens on you will get either 100% methylated or 0% methylated, except very, very few regions in the genome. Uh, in our human genome, the maternal copy and paternal copy are different. The mom copy of the chromosome and the dad copy of the chromosome can have different methylation patterns. And these are called the imprinted regions. Uh, most of these imprinted regions are related to embryonic development are saying, you know, the, the dad wants the baby to be as big as possible, but the mom doesn't want the, the, the baby to be too big that she can't give birth, you know, then both will die. So there's some, some evolutionary reasons why the mom copy and dad copy might want to have a different effect on the baby. Okay, so these are the imprinted regions that are different. So um, we can actually use this phenomenon to estimate, for example, tumor purity. So, um, you can imagine when we have a tumor sample, you do a DNA methylation. You think that this piece of tissue is coming from surgery. They are probably all tumor. And so you take out the, you know, the tumor sample you do by sulfide sequencing for, for DNA methylation mapping. In reality, it's in that chunk of whatever tissue, it's not all tumor. Very often there are normal cells in there as well. And so if you look at a, Let's look at some regions that say if they have different methylation, say in this region, the tumors are methylated. So this is one gene. But in a normal, it's unmethylated. What's going to happen is, uh, so this is the read coming from the tumor samples in this region. You will see that every, sorry, by the way, every circle in here represents one CG instant. If this CG is methylated, the next CG will also be methylated. The next CG will be methylated, and so on. Remember, so pretty much you can see this. In this cell, most of the CGs are methylated. In the next cell, this is another. So every row here is a different cell. In the next cancer cell, uh, most of the CGs are methylated. There are some exceptions, but most of the CGs uh, in this region are methylated. But imagine, say, in the, in the normal sample in this region, most of the reads in, in this region are unmethylated. And so the result is when you have to look at the sequencing read, what you will see that all the reads that lands in this region, um, they are either all methylated or they are all unmethylated. And that ratio, that difference, that ratio will tell you what is the tumor normal percentage. Of course, this is only one region. Uh, there, there could be some noise. Uh, we, we are looking at hundreds or thousands of CPG regions like this. And if in most of the regions you will see a 70, 30, you will know that your tumor purity is probably either 30, 30 or 70. Uh, Jet. It seems like, I, like, I mean, you mentioned that BSC is really expensive. It seems like an expensive way to determine tumor purity. Are there like other ways of Ah, yeah, so the question is, it seems like it's an expensive way to determine tumor purity. It's true. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, when people do these tumor purity estimates, initially you ask a pathologist to give you this. They look by eye. And later on, people started doing sequencing, you know, from whole exome sequencing, you can get a tumor purity. Um, there are also people doing bisulfide sequencing. The purpose of getting the tumor purity, I mean, we are doing the bisulfide sequencing not with the goal of doing tumor purity. It's just uh, side information you get for free if you're already mapping DNA methylation. And so recently, people have been mapping tumor purity either from copy number change or from the two alleles, because there's the mom copy and the dad copy, you can just look at whether the reads are balanced between the mom and dad and figure out whether there is a purity difference. Um, and then also, uh, you can use DNA methylation to estimate tumor purity. Interestingly, these three results are quite consistent, and they are very different from the pathologist's estimate. So you can decide who is more <laughs> accurate. Um, yeah, so that's uh, one issue. Um, another one we, we, we mentioned is that 
DNA methylation, the, the real goal of, or the function of DNA methylation is to control gene expression. So the very first thing we mentioned is there are repeat regions in the genome or regions that need to be completely silenced in the genome. These are huge chunks, usually of KB, hundreds of KB or even potentially megabase long that were coming from you know, viral genome, so if some virus integrated in the genome, in order to prevent it from jumping around, you can, the human genome have learned to use DNA methylation to kind of bury it and you know, not see it or not allowing it to get activated. You can also use it to maintain genome stability. Um, if all the genome is active, it's going through all the radiation or whatever, it's, it's, it's going to create a lot of um, uh, mutations from UV or whatever. So having DNA methylation helped to maintain the genome stability. And so these regions are usually, you know, big, big chunks and uh, totally methylated to maintain the genome stability. So these probably accounts for 50% of the human genome. Okay. Then um, in the remaining part, that's kind of all oh, more gene rich, more active regions in the genome. What people have found is that um, very often we mentioned uh, this is one gene, so these are the axons, right? And what people found is that the, usually in the promoter there's a CPG island, and methylation at the CPG island can control the expression of that nearby gene. So most of the CPG island happens right like within 1 kb from the transcription star site of the gene, and if this CPG island is methylated, this nearby gene will be silent you will not get a chance to transcribe. So that's a very, very important thing to, 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 do, to happen. But um, surprisingly, yeah, so uh, people also found that when this gene needs to be highly expressed, that for some reason on their axons, they also see, especially the later axons, they also see DNA methylation directly on the axon. And there are some studies exploring this function. Yeah, so this, uh, what they found was that potentially this is one, one mechanism, is if this region has DNA methylation, polymerase II will know not to go there. Right? That's how you, you use a CPG island. So if this CPG island is methylated, then the polymerase will not go there to transcribe the, the gene. And so if this region is not methylated, Polymerase may not know where to go initially, so it will waste a lot of time going to irrelevant axons or start a transcription on the wrong axon. Instead, if you have these internal axons methylated, then polymerase doesn't waste time to go there. It will just go to the correct CPG island that's not methylated. Then you will go to the correct transcription star site and transcribing from the first axon of the gene. That this is just one proposed mechanism of you know what methylation can, can do. And so you can imagine in order for this region to be transcribed, the promoter CPG island needs to be unmethylated and then polymerase can go there and then on the internal axons you want the DNA methylations to be there in order for polymerase not to waste time lingering around there. Too. So they, 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 will, they will always go to the beginning of the gene to start transcription. Okay, so that's one mechanism. Um, yeah, I, this is something I just mentioned. Some genes could be imprinted. So the mother copy and the father copy of the DNA have different methylation. So in the human genome, there are only about like 100 such regions that are different. Okay. Um, and so uh, that's one interesting observation. Uh, there's another interesting observation. Um, there are some regions in the genome you can see this is the methylation ratio you can see initially it was like very methylated and suddenly there's a big chunk of unmethylated canyon uh, and this is not short it's 10 kb long and this is even longer than 10 kb suddenly this region even though they do have cg you can see here is a the C cpg island is only in the green ones, only small regions in here. These, that's the real CPG island. But then somehow within this big chunk, it's all unmethylated. These are called the large unmethylated canyons. 
And so when people look at those regions, they look at what, what are the genes that are enriched here. Interestingly, from like gene ontology analysis, they found they are enriched for very important factors um, that, you know, with genes that have, you know, this is embryonic stem cell uh, DNA methylation pattern, they see it's related to embryonic morphogenesis, is related to RNA metabolism, homeobox transcription regulation. So a lot of transcription factors in the cell have, have uh, these type of DNA methylation canyons, which has no methylation. Can you guess what is happening here? You can imagine uh, very often these are transcription factors that are very, very important for that cell. And in order to turn on this transcription factor, there are many, many transcription, other transcription factors that have to bind near this gene in order to turn it on, right? From if you were to do chip seek, you will see that these other regions potentially can be already bound by the transcription factor. They are clearing the way. And if they are there, they kind of prevent like DNA methylation to go there and methylate the region. And so this region, the promoter of these important transcription factors are usually not methylated. This gene is getting ready to be transcribed. And if you look at the gene, there are two, there are two uh, uh, different uh, situations when you have these type of uh, unmethylated canyon. In one situation, this gene is not expressed. Uh, because in the next lecture, we'll, we'll explain to you guys, um, there is H3K27 acetylation. It's another way of silencing the region, but temporarily. In some sense, DNA methylation is a more stable you know, activation. You want to really bury it for three years or you know, like for a long time. But if you just kind of want to close the door temporarily, but you can open very quickly, uh, you use histone modification, which uh, HDK27 trimethylation is a way to temporarily close it, but also HDK4 trimethylation is to potentially open it. So you can see there's the close and open battling each other. And so, uh, in, in, sorry, in the bottom case, the battle is over, uh, the opening the door when, and in this case, this gene start transcribing. So you can see here, yeah, this is another trans, well, this is a, another important, it is an epigenetic factor, it's important. And you can see um, the DNA CPG island at the transcription start site is not methylated. And I bet there are also many other transcription factor binding sites near this, this region. That's why it needs to be cleared out of, like the DNA methylation clear out of the way. And before this factor needs to be active, maybe you also have K27, but now this region is, the battle is over. This region is opened up by this H3K4 trimethylation. You can see that it's not by the K4, but at least an indication this door is totally open now. And you can see RNA expression is happening. And so in some sense, epigenetics is a shadow of what happened, well, in some sense, a shadow of what's happening in, in, the, in the human genome. And if you want to silent a region for a very long time, you use DNA methylation. But if this region can be on or can be off, but could, could potentially be important, you want both the, 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 you know, somebody to close the door and somebody to open the door to be there. Whenever the condition is right, you just change the balance, then this gene can be on or off. Okay, so that's a, another case. And so uh, this is another observation from uh, my uh, colleague Rabbi Rafael Urizari. They, they found that sorry, they found that um, there are prevalent misregulation of DNA methylation in cancer. So, um, so they, they so they found that in cancer, a lot of the time the, the the repeat element, you know, the 50% of normally silent regions are usually uh, less methylated. And so the genome is not very stable now. A lot of, you know, those, uh, the, the zombies are coming up. In some sense, you can think about the repeat are like viruses that are buried, right? They're like zombies and now they're becoming alive. They're trying to transcribe and get activated. So the regions that you are supposed to silent is no longer silent, but also some of the CPG methylation regions become uh, really 
abnormally methylated. Especially they can see, for example, this region previously is very heavily methylated. And then you see this canyon region. And then there's other regions that are methylated. And then in cancers, you will see the, the, the nearby regions. In some sense, uh, transcription regulation on these nearby regions become basically starting to be out of control gradually. You are eroding the boundary of where things need to be on and where things need to be off. Okay, and so these kind of methylation variable regions in the genome, we would imagine contain a lot of transcription factor binding to regulate that, that the expression of this canyon, right? And then the boundaries are being eroded. And so you can see a lot of DNA methylation changes in, in cancer. And uh, this is uh, what we mentioned before. Previously, people thought you can only do DNA methylation, but later research found that you can use different enzymes to do demethylation in the, this location. And one of the important enzymes is called TET. TET is a transcription factor. And it goes to, actually, if you map where TET goes, it goes to a lot of the transcription factor binding site. And, and when they go there, those regions that were originally methylated can become gradually unmethylated. The very first step is to create this hydroxy methyl C, it's the first step, and then it's a formal C, carboxy C, and eventually it will become an unmethylated C. And so um, when people try to map, map either the MHC or they map where TET goes, they found that it's very often highly enriched in the transcription factor binding site. It means that when the transcription factor needs to come on now and bind, it will try to recruit the TAD enzyme there to demethylate the region so that it can bind and then open up the region and demethylate the rest of the, the regions in the genome, okay? And interestingly, TAD family proteins are important for this and uh, in several cancers, now people found there are a lot of mutations in the TAD uh, protein, which probably prevented the right transcription factors to come on and uh, DNA methylation to be abnormally regulated. And so in general, it's a very, very interesting phenomenon to use DNA methylation to help maintain the epigenetic status. You know which region needs to be silent, which region needs to be active, and which region kind of can be regulated. Okay, questions on DNA methylation? <laughs>